Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Allen, your host for HGTV series of Community Champions. Despite the distresses COVID-19 has put on all our communities, we are witnessing a universal generosity from financial donations to volunteering to those who are just sharing their expertise that might support someone else getting back on track. At HTTV, our focus is always on you, our community. And during this pandemic, there's nothing different. We are highlighting extraordinary people who are making up our great community all across the state and basically telling the story of what the best of humanity looks like during a difficult time. Thank you for watching and stay safe. Joining me today is Assemblywoman Nancy Munoz from District 21 in New Jersey. Thank you so much for coming on today, Nancy. I am thrilled to have you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I thought you were a great person to have come on today because not only are you an Assemblywoman, you sit on both the Budget and the Health Committee, but you're also volunteering and making masks. And as a licensed registered nurse, you understand the, health, the needs of the healthcare workers and you're volunteering, I thought this was amazing, you're volunteering at the um, testing centers for COVID. I'm pretty sure people are curious how that works. Can you talk a little bit about your experience there and um, what your role has been? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I started there a few, quite a few weeks ago toward the beginning of when Union County was starting to do the testing. Um, it's, it's at Kane University. It's in the parking lot. We're under tents. And so we, um, every week it gets better and better and more organized. And I have to give kudos to the, or the Office of Emergency Management at Union County and the organizers because it's very organized. We have uh, workers from U Union County. We have the National Guard is there because there's a, a large number of people. We, every day we have hundreds and hundreds of cars that come through. They show their identification. They, they, they have to have a, a prescription from their healthcare provider, which means they have to have symptoms, um, either a fever, cough, um, and have a prescription. And initially, it was only people from Union County. We've now expanded that so that um, healthcare providers, first responders, law enforcement from other counties are also coming through. Uh, at least, you know, they come through, they're identified, they give their information, uh, it goes into a central uh, area, and we get a, a piece of paper that says the person's name, date of birth, um, their email address, their phone number. And so there's a three-step process. Um, I worked at two parts, two parts of the process. One, uh, confirming the information, making sure the identification is, is correct, that the name matches, that the date of birth matches, that the address, if they don't have a, we've had a couple people who um, are, are not citizens of the United States, but they have an address in Union County. They bring, they bring their uh, piece of mail with them. We know they're a Union County resident. But from then, where I've been working mostly is under the tent where the testing is taking place. Um, it's very much a wind tunnel there because it's these tents out in the middle of a thing. And so you're really dealing with it, with the elements. It's been, it's been unusually cool this past couple, you know, past six to eight weeks. And so it's been pretty unpleasant under the tents, but we have hair, hair nets on, we have a gown on, we have face masks on and we get, we get fit, fitted for the um, N95, for the face masks, so that they fit our faces properly. We have a, a face shield on, and we have triple gloves on, so that when we come out of the out of the tent, we can decontaminate ourselves properly, so we can remove our equipment properly. People pull up, we, we check their identification, and then we, the first thing we do is they ask the person to blow into their nose into a tissue, and that's to basically clear the airway, and also because it tickles when we put the this um, swab up there, people sneeze, and we want to try to control that sneezing a little bit. And then we do the swabbing, and you know, one of us writes the name and date of birth and date on the on the test tube, and and the other we put it into a bag, and it gets all it's all processed. It's very very organized. But in three and a half hours, we did over sixty tests. Um, I happened to be fortunate that I was there when the Blue Angels and Thunderbirds flew directly over. The testing site and that was awe inspiring i mean we yeah. all stopped we, we got notification they were coming over everyone stepped one foot out of their tent and that really you know it really gave us all hope yeah. um all of us are there as volunteers i've developed um 
friendships with um, people I never would have met otherwise, uh, the people who are might otherwise be out of work and are volunteering here, people who are furloughed, people who take a day off from work just to come down and test. Um, what I would say about the people who come through, for the most part, they're terrified. Um, they, the ones at the beginning looked more terrified. I think as we've gone along, people are look less frightened. I think they're more reassured. I think there's a sense that maybe it's going to be okay. We reassure everybody. We tell everyone, we hope you feel better. Um, because like I said, it's all healthcare professionals doing the swabbing, doing the testing. And we're used to trying, we're used to that role of doing our jobs, but making sure that we reassure the person. What they've also are doing is there's a lot of people who don't have access to cars. So how do we get them tested? So yesterday I saw groups go out in the ambulances uh, with a testing group and they went to the homes of those who aren't able to come. So we see that we're evolving every day. We're moving, you know, we keep changing how we do it to make it more efficient. And like I said, the, the, it is so well run at the Union County testing facility that it's, it's very impressive. That sounds One day last week, we tested 717 patients in a day. Wow. How, how many hours are you there in a day? Well, we do it in shifts. So we, I get there at 8 a.m. and our first shift goes out at 9. We get there so we get a debriefing on what's going on, with, where, which tent we're in. It takes a while to get your, your garb on. We help each other um, get that on. We stay out there for, for, for a four-hour shift. They give you a break for lunch and another crew comes out. We had instructions in English and in Spanish. We give people instructions in an envelope how to get your results. It is several days to wait. Um, and so we give plenty of information. And in that envelope of information, we also have mental health services uh, resources, phone numbers. And I think that's critically important. It's like if you're feeling you know, depressed, if you're feeling anxious, like there's a numbers to call. And I have the, um, I put that up on my Facebook posting because the mental health part of this is so important. People are frightened for their health and they're frightened for their economic health. Absolutely. I think that's what's really tricky about the pandemic. It's emotional, it's financial, people are isolated. And there is a lot of discussion that the next pandemic will, once everything gets started again, it's actually going to be a mental health crisis. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, you know, as a nurse, I see it. There's two parts of it that I see that are going to be problematic. Number one, I see the mental health component. And I think that that's going to be legitimate. And I think that our, you know, because of this um, pandemic, we actually had an executive order that allowed the advanced practice nurses, in, in which many are psych nurses, to allow to practice to the full extent of their license without a financial obligation of having to pay a physician to do to do so and and I thought that was really incredible because we really need to have allow all the people who are providers of health care to work to the full extent of the license been working for on this issue for 11 years it took this crisis to get there and I'm hoping that we're going to find out that the sky is not going to fall because of it so we we need to we need to realize that we're going to need these help these mental health providers I think the other thing that's really critically important is that we're seeing that our emergency rooms are very much um, much quieter than usual. Now you could say maybe the trauma center will be quieter because people aren't driving as much, but we're, we're seeing and we're expecting as healthcare providers that we're seeing that people may have been having maybe a minor heart attack and staying home because they're afraid to go to the ER. They, they may have had a small stroke and are afraid to go. I think we're going to see a surge in what our typical healthcare has been. We're going to see a surge in that afterwards. So it's going to be a mental health part and also that return to what we see in regular health care. Also, all those elective surgeries that have been canceled. And elective surgeries is a, is a very vague term. You know, we know people in healthcare who are doing things like spine surgery. Well, spine, some of the spine surgeries are considered elective surgeries, yet you can't do your job because you can't move because you're, 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 your spinal cord is impinged by, you know, by something. So, you know, we're going to have to catch up with all of that. All of those, you know, things like colonoscopies and mammograms, we have to catch up with all of that. The other thing that's really important, and I, you know, I have an 11 month old granddaughter, is, is that we're finding that children aren't getting their immunizations. Pediatricians' offices are not seeing the same number of patients. There's a 
the kids are being immunized. So we have to be very much aware that we may see a, a bend in healthcare that we just don't expect, didn't expect because of this. So, you know, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, what are the lessons learned then? Because now that we've experienced this pandemic, I'm sure it's not gonna be the last. So what, from your perspective, is there anything that we've learned, whether as a state or a country, that we can do differently or better so that we're prepared for the next time around? You know, I, that's an excellent question. And, and I think about that often because I think one of the things that we saw at the very beginning um, was that we saw a shortage of, of, of ventilators. The ventilator is the actual machine that helps the person breathe. A respirator is a, is a type of mask. But the ventilators, we had a shortage of this. We had been warned, I think, many years ago that we, you know, we could have a pandemic, but we, I think a lot of places didn't actually prepare. And it's been impressive that we've seen like the GE plant automatically switch gears and say, instead of making building cars, we're going to build ventilators. So I think we need to be prepared. I don't think anybody knew how much of a grip on a respiratory system this was going to be and the need for ventilators. Um, so I think going forward, we, we need to have a, a plan for that. You know, like I talked at the beginning about the redeployment of the healthcare people. We, it, people had jobs within healthcare. And, and I think that what people started to do is, you know, the, the leaders in healthcare started to do as we started to get a sense that this was going to, was coming to the United States and it was going to be bad was we started to set up plans on redeployment. How do we take the nurse the doctor who works in a same day surgery center and move that person from that situate from that location to an acute care hospital where you're seeing many patients. So, you know, I, I've talked to many of my colleagues and friends are nurse leaders and, you know, they set up teams of, of, they have, a critical care nurse whose teams with a former critical care nurse who's moved out of that setting with two RNs who have never done critical care. They become a team. And so you have the expertise of the critical care and we start to look at a different way of patterning our care. So maybe we're going to start to see pandemic plans on how we read It's called redeployment. Mm -hmm. We have things called, you know, every time you, you switch patients, you move out of one patient room to another, you had to change all your gear. So now they have somebody called a runner. That's a nurse who stays out of the patient rooms, but is the person who can give the medications to the nurse in the room, who can give the blood if it's needed, or do anything that's needed. With like clean nurse, feet. dirty nurse, right? Clean nurse, dirty nurse. And so, you know, we can see, we can make a plan. I think what we're going to see is more planning of, as far as teamwork, planning on redeployment from areas that they need fewer healthcare providers to where areas where you need more. And also how to make sure we have a stockpile of equipment, the ventilators, the masks, the um, gowns that we need, all of those things that we need in a facility to be ready and, and, and available when the pandemic hits. Because most in most healthcare situations, the way things are, you know, I was there at the beginning of the AIDS um, crisis. We didn't know it was trans how it was transmitted. Um, we didn't know it was transmitted by body fluids. We, there was a lot of things we didn't know. And we made a lot of changes as a result. Universal precautions came about because of the AIDS um, mm -hmm. epidemic. We, we treat everybody the same because we assume everyone, we want, we want to treat everyone the same. And we don't want to discriminate, but we also don't want to assume that you have it or you don't have it. So we made changes as a healthcare system because of that. So we evolved as we saw how things changed. This is airborne. So we're going to see differences and we're going to, that's why we see people wearing masks in public. At, at the beginning of this, they thought that only those who were infected should wear masks. Now there's, it's been mandated that everybody wear masks. And I think that's why we're seeing so many people making masks right. because the mask isn't going, doesn't have to be the N95, because those are the really, I mean, you need the small particle um, protection for the healthcare workers. But this is, you know, the socially distanced people so that you can have an interaction. I think it's wonderful that we have groups that are making masks. Like I said, I'm making masks. I, I was- um, yeah, Tell me about the masks, because you've made quite a few. I just, you know, right before we came on this call, I decided to take a look at, at I've been keeping a tally of who I've sent them to. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was over 110 that I've made in my own in my kitchen. Um, I've been I've been getting my um, fabric from Etsy. I have I make a lot of them with the straps. Um, anybody who needs them, 
I send them to, I, I got a call from somebody I know through my job and he was frantic because his father-in-law was ill and he had seven month old twins. Oh. I made him masks. He came to pick them up. You know, I'm willing to do it for anybody who needs them. How has this changed the business in Trenton? Because you've been doing it differently. You can't go down to Trenton. So can you talk a little bit about that? According to the Constitution of the new state of New Jersey, we have to be in Trenton to vote. So we had to change, pass a bill. Mm -hmm. So we, we passed, as an emergency, we passed, we can now do a virtual voting session. And we have done two. We, we, there's 80 of us in the assembly and there's 40 in the Senate. And we've done them at different times. And the, so the clerk is there and either Craig Coughlin, who's the speaker, is down in Trenton, along with the staff, and or the Senate President Sweeney and the clerk. And then what we all do is we log in. We're asked to log in like an hour and a half before because it take each one of us has to be verified that it's us. Mm -hmm. So you have to get all eight of us on on the call. And then we we go through. We get the bill notes in the traditional way, which is electronically. We we see the legislation, which has been mostly recently about how we can help as a result of this pandemic, whether it's the virtual lear uh, learning uh, through the schools, um, whether it's it's resources, wh whatever it is. Um, and then we go down the list. We start with the A's and, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of the alphabet MU. So, you know, you, I just, you listen and then I get to the M's and I, you know, and, and then you get to Munoz and you say your name, you say yes or no. And so we, we have had two virtual voting sessions. And what's really important to get out there is that every one of our legislative offices is run is open and running they're not open at the site but they're working from home the biggest um thing that's been happening is that the unemployment insurance claims people have not been getting their money each legislative office has gotten hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of requests for assistance with their unemployment insurance there's other issues that came up as well people who work certain people who aren't haven't gotten paid who are either county or state employees, we're helping to facilitate that. And then the rest, you know, Tom, Senator Kane and John and I are each doing what we can do to help, whether it's, you know, volunteering at the testing center, volunteering to pick up um, supplies and food, et cetera, and doing what we can do. My sense is that people want to help. And whether it's working at the tents, making masks, making donations, I have friends who are delivering sandwiches to Newark, to kids who are, have food insecurity. Um, I donated to the Community Food Bank of New Jersey because I volunteered there years ago, and they are a great distribution center for the food banks across the state. And so they need money to restock their supplies. And so, and we see what was going on in, in Summit. Um, we have, I live within several blocks of, of Cornock Field at Memorial Field and people line up for food every day. And it, you know, people want to help. We're all in this to help and to do what we can. If those who are afraid to go out can make a donation online. We, we're lucky in so many ways that everything is online these days, you know, with virtual, but we're doing virtually. Um, but also you can make a donation online and it's, that's one way you can help if you're, if you can't sew, if you can't, cook if you can't if you are of a certain age that you know i went on the summer um website to volunteer and you know you don't really want to go work in a soup kitchen if you're of a certain age because you're in the vulnerable category but you can make a donation so there's always a way that any one of us can help Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Munoz. You're absolutely right. There are numerous ways for people to give, and we're putting them up on the screen. And we truly appreciate your time today and wish you the best of luck. And we're going to let you go because we know you have a lot to take care of. Have a great day. Thank you.